I'd like to uh, address the subject today. I haven't talked about it just specifically in quite a while. We've talked a lot about the law, but a one specific aspect of the law I'd like to address today, and that's uh, a topic actually it's been mentioned uh, mentioned in the opening prayer, mentioned uh, when Ken first got up right away. It's good to have him be here together on the Sabbath. I want to talk about the Sabbath. Now I know I'm not here to convince any of you because you're here. You don't need convincing, but it doesn't hurt to look at, uh, go back and look at some of the basics from time to time, and to, uh, I like to do it in, in a way of apologetics. What I want to do is take a look at this document, the, Winst the Westminster Confession of Faith, read portions of it, show you what it says about the Ten Commandments, about the law in general, the moral law, and specifically what it says about the Fourth Commandment, and we will see that this is very, a very good document in many ways. Uh, it's very logical, very scriptural, and then all of a sudden it takes a left turn, and we'll see where it takes the left turn at and what's the problem with it is. So I'd like to begin just uh, reading a little bit from this uh, particular document. I want to read from, uh, we'll begin with uh, the section on... Uh, entitled now this is this is under well first of all let me just read from the Westminster Confession itself what this is this is a book it has it's a study guide for those who adhere to believe in the Westminster Confession of Faith that's one of the reformed confessions that came out of previous centuries and is uh, was adopted by Presbyterians and maybe some reformed Baptist anyway it's a reformed document so this represents the reformed movement, the confession does. Now this is a study guide, which means it has the confession quoted, portions of it at a time, sections of it, and then it has commentary to follow so it can be used in a study group situation. I'm not recommending that you use this necessarily uh, in your study groups, but uh, I would like to read a little bit from it. First of all, in the section from the confession, uh, section uh, 19, uh, entitled, Of the Law of God. Here's what it says. It says, God gave to Adam a law as a covenant of works. Now, covenant of works, that's Reformation language. Now, you'll pick up on what it means as I read this. But it says, God gave Adam to Adam a law as a, a, as a covenant of works, by which he bound him and all his posterity to personal, entire, exact and perpetual obedience promise life upon the fulfilling and threaten death upon the breach of it so that's what the, that's what this law that God gave to Adam uh, that was it was a covenant of works meaning he had to obey it perfectly and to do so meant he would have life but to breach the law, to break it at any point, means that he has death. Of course, we know what happened. And endued him with power and ability to keep it. So Adam had the ability to keep the law. God gave him the ability, and then he gave them this law. Now, this is point number two, paragraph number two, under this section. This law after his fall, continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness. So his fall didn't do away with the law. That's what he's saying here. That's what this confession says. And as such was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai in Ten Commandments. So the same law that God gave to Adam was given through at Mount Sinai in the form of Ten Commandments. Same law. And written in two tables, the first four commandments containing our duty towards God, and the other six our duty to man. Now, does anyone see anything wrong with that statement? I see a whole lot right with it. He's right on the money. It's, it's a great statement here. But then he goes on in the uh, commentary section. He goes on to say this. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing. He goes through each of the commandments. I'm not going to take the time to go through all of them. But I do want to, before we get to the fourth, I want to look at what he says about the second commandment. You'll find this quite interesting. He says, the second commandment teaches us how we are to worship God. How we are to worship God. Notice that. We are to worship God only as he has commanded us to worship him. 
Very important. Only as he has commanded us to worship him. Anything that man devises, invents, or imagines corrupts the true reverence and worship of God. And he goes on to say, this commandment is frequently violated when Christians have, now get this, when, picture, when Christians have pictures of Jesus. Have you ever heard that from a Protestant before? There are some old school, very conservative Presbyterians who hold to this confession of faith who still teach that. You will not see pictures of Jesus uh, in their churches. So some of them still believe this. It says, when it is said that they are legitimate because they are not used in worship, talking about the pictures of Jesus, we reply that they are not legitimate because one cannot have a proper thought or feeling with respect to Christ other than that of reverence and worship. So if you have a proper thought or feeling about Christ, it must be of reverence or worship. And if you're looking at a picture of Jesus and you're having a thought of reverence of worship, then you're looking at a picture and having that reverence toward the picture. So it's idolatry. That's what they're saying here. Hey, that's not a bad statement. Now then, we go on to the fourth commandment. You will find this also very interesting. It says, the fourth commandment teaches us when we are to worship and serve God. Notice the second says how we're to do it. We're not to do it in any other way other than the way He has shown us. Then here it says, with the fourth commandment teaches us when we are to worship and serve God. We are to spend one whole day in worship and six days in serving God. So the other six days, you know, the one day of worship, that's for worship specifically. The other six days, you serve God in your daily work, in your family life, everything you do, it's in service to God. And I think, well, that's a pretty good statement there. The one day that belongs to God is a day of rest. That is, of cessation from the labor and recreation of other days, except for works of necessity, piety, and mercy. And now, he says, this commandment is frequently violated. It is violated in two ways. It is violated when the Lord's day is desecrated. It is also violated when one of the other six days is is designated as a holy day by mere human authority. As in the case of, get this, Christmas or Good Friday. Wow. Well, there are some of the old school Presbyterians to this day who do not observe those things because, because they're man-made. So, but keep that in mind though, this is very important. It's a violation of the fourth commandment whenever you take one of the other six days that's not a, the Lord's day and make it into a holy day. Okay, that's, that's all very good. I'd like to move on now a little further to uh, skip over quite a few pages. Uh, he goes on to reaffirm, as we've already seen, the Ten Commandments were in force from Adam all the way and still in force today. But later on when he talks more specifically about religious worship uh, and Sabbath day, the confession reads, The light of nature showeth that there is a God who hath lordship and sovereignty over all, is good and doth, I'll, I'll stop using the old English, doeth good and does good unto all and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart and with all the soul and with all the might. That's biblical right there, isn't it? Certainly is. But the acceptable way of worshiping the true God, this is very important. Keep, you've got to keep this in mind before we get to the rest of what he says about the fourth commandment. The acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself. Not by men, by himself and so limited by his own revealed will. Get that. Limited by his own revealed will. It means, of course, remember this is a reform document. It means, of course, that you do not have a magisterium or a pope who dictates to you what is the will of God. Okay? 
but it God himself gives you his will. Now how so? Well, let's read on. That he may not be worshipped according to the imaginations and devices of men. In other words, something people make up. Or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation, i.e. Pope, Bishop, what have you. Or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. So you get that. It is limited. Our way of worshiping God is limited to, defined by, limited by, the revelation of God himself through the Holy Scriptures. Okay, very good. I would agree with that. How many of you disagree with it? May I see a show of hands? No, no show of hands. You all agree with it. You believe, you believe the Bible is the word of God and that uh, we go by that, not some pope, pope or magisterium or bishop or, you know, college of cardinals or, uh, you know, even ministers. We don't go by what ministers say. We, the ministry says, it should say at least, don't believe me, but believe your Bible. Check your Bible. Go by your Bible, not by what I tell you. And this, would, this is in agreement with that. So he goes on then to say, uh, well, he gives, he gives uh, several examples of the scriptures to define, that, uh, to define exactly what he means by this so limited by the revealed will. I'm not going to go through that. You understand that already. I just want to go on over now to uh, a few pages over to where he talks uh, more specifically about the fourth commandment, the Sabbath day itself. He says, that he doesn't say, but the confession says, it says, as it is of the law of nature, that in general, a due proportion of time be set apart for the worship of God. What he means by this is the, when he mentions law of nature, that's something if you understand God exists, then obviously you understand you owe him your worship, don't you? You, you, don't, you understand by nature you know, there are pagan countries, I say countries that are, before they were even, uh, before the missionaries got to them, people didn't have Bibles, who believed in God, and they worshiped God. This nature tells you, there's something in, in the heart of humankind tells, tells us that we should worship God. Okay? It's, it's written in nature. And obviously it means if you're going to worship God, you need to devote time to Him, don't you? Yes, that's just, that's in nature. So that's what he's talking about here in this first part where he says, as it is, as it is of the law of nature, that in general a due proportion of time be set apart for the worship of God. So in his word, by a positive, moral, and perpetual commandment, binding all men in all ages, he hath particularly appointed one day in seven for Sabbath particularly one day in seven for a Sabbath, to be kept holy unto him, which from the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ was the last day of the week. Wait a minute, what do you mean, until the resurrection? Now, remember what we said, what this confession says about how so limited is our practice to the revelation of God's word. Remember that. And here he says, and from the resurrection of Christ was changed into the first day of the week, which in Scripture is called the Lord's Day. And is to be continued to the end of the world as the Christian Sabbath. Now boy, did they take a left turn there, didn't they? So how in the world do you get from all those wonderful statements about the authority of Scripture about Scripture tells us how to worship God and how we must limit our practice according to what Scripture reveals. And I ask the question, when we get to this point, I said, okay, where does the Scripture say that all of a sudden, you know, here Christ, they acknowledge Jesus kept the Sabbath. The disciples, when they were taught by Jesus, they were all keeping the Sabbath. And they kept the Sabbath right up until His death. And they even still continue to keep the Sabbath until he arose. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden now the Sabbath is shifted over to the first day of the week. Where is that in Scripture? Please tell me. Where is it? Well, we'll look at those Scriptures that they give here. You're familiar with them already, but we'll, we'll look, take a brief look at them anyway. I'd like to go in and read a little bit more here, though. 
uh, in the commentary section, he says, uh, he, he asks this question, well, what about those who deny that the Sabbath day has been changed from the seventh day to the first day of the week? Seventh-day Adventists, among others, insist that the fourth commandment perpetually obligates an observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord. We believe, okay, here we go now. He's not saying what the Bible says yet. He says, we believe that this view is disproved by two considerations. Number one, first, the fourth commandment does not say, remember the seventh day. But remember the Sabbath day. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it does. That's correct. It says remember the Sabbath day. And it tells you which day it is, though. You leave that part out. Just leave that part out. Okay. There is a difference. The difference is the distinction between proportion and order. Now listen to this reasoning. Remember what he said previously, or what the confession says about the devices of Satan, about the imaginations of men, and about, in other words, made up stuff. The difference is the, is the distinction between proportion and order. When the commandment specifies that six of our days are for our duty, for one duty, I'm sorry, and the remaining portion of the week, one-seventh to be exact, for another duty, it avoids precisely what the Seventh-day Adventist position requires. It avoids commanding us to remember the seventh day in the order of time that it might command us to observe the seventh day in the proportion of time. In other words, as long as this one-seventh of that time of those seven days. Oh, come on, come on now, really. I have to ask the question again, how do you get that out of Scripture? If you're going by Scripture, now if you have an infallible interpreting authority, or you think you do, like a Pope or a Magisterium or whatever, okay, I get that. If you think they're inspired, just like Scripture, that God is leading the church through them, okay. But you have to have that, because you can't get this out of Scripture, as we shall see. Since the fourth commandment directs us to observe the seventh part of our time as a Sabbath, there is nothing in this commandment that does not apply with full force to the first day of the week. Well, wait a minute. I have to ask the question, why the first day of the week? What if I am a Wednesday guy? What if I want to make Thursday my Sabbath? Why can't I split it up a seventh of, a seventh of your, your time? Then why can't I take uh, 12 hours out of Monday and 12 hours out of Thursday? Why can't you do that? But anyway, he says it, it, it can apply, it now applies full force to the first day of the week as to the order of days. For the day, first day of the week is still the seventh as far as the pro, proportion of time is concerned. So what, do you, what would you call that? Is that biblical reasoning? Is that scriptural reasoning? reasoning? And would you say it is consistent with what has already been said about how we're, our practice is to be so limited by the revelation of God's word? I think it's very inconsistent, wouldn't you say? And then the second point, I'm not going to go through that. He gives another point. I'm going to read this part. It's in the second part, part though. I won't read the whole thing. It just uh, says, second, we simply observe what the apostolic church observed the first day of the week. Now here we're going to get into the scriptures. Here's his scriptural proof for the trans transition from, or the transfer of the Sabbath requirements from the seventh day to the first day of the week. This is it, right here. As he's, again, I'll read it again. Second, we simply observe that the apostolic church observed the first day of the week as to order of days as the seventh portion or Sabbath. See Matthew 28, 1, a Three of these scriptures I'm not going to turn to. I'm just going to tell you what they say because they all speak of the same event. Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 2, Luke 24, 1. All of them speak of the women going to the tomb on the first day of the week because they wanted to anoint the body and so forth. So this is what all of those are about and all of them mention the first day of the week. <clears throat> Of course, that was the next opportunity they had to do this. Uh, I'm not going to get into, 
you know, it's, it's ordinarily assumed that uh, Christ rose on Sunday morning. I'm not going to get into the order of events of the crucifixion and resurrection. But I'll just say this. <clears throat> he appeared on Sunday morning to the disciples. So Sunday was the day of the resurrection appearances, even though we think he, we believe he, he rose late Saturday afternoon just before sunset. <clears throat> but in any case, aside from that, this, this was the day of the resurrection appearances. It was also, it was also, and this is important, Wave Sheaf Sunday. The day of the Wave Sheaf. But anyway, in, in uh, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, they all refer to the same event, and they all mention the first day of the week. So that's, uh, that's not surprising. It really proves nothing. It just tells you when they went to anoint the body and found it was gone. Okay, now I'm going to, I am going to look at one text that's given here, and this is in uh, John chapter 20. So if you turn there with me, John chapter 20, we'll go through the proof text for the point they're trying to make. John 20. And we want to look at uh, verse 1. Verse 1. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Okay, so she goes on and looks. He's not there. And the assumption is they've taken him. But uh, then, of course, this uh, person appears to, it, to her, and uh, she realizes, that it's, realizes that it is the risen Lord. He's risen. And then, of course, she runs to tell Peter and John. And then it says, uh, that, you know, the story there. We don't need to go through that. I just want to emphasize this happened on the first day of the week, as the synoptic Gospels tell us. Same thing. But then it says on ni in, in verse 19, on the evening of that day, apparently meaning it was late in the day, the first day of the week, the doors were being locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. So this is an appearance on still on the first day of the week. So he appears to Mary Magdalene. If you look at the other accounts, he appears to the other women. Now here he appears to the disciples behind locked doors. And it's still the first day of the week. So several of these appearances took place that day. First day of the week. Wave sheaf Sunday. And then we're told uh, in verse 26, eight days later, that's a Semitic uh, expression meaning a week later. So presumably, presumably the next Sunday, eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And this is where he proved to Thomas that he really had risen, you know, doubting Thomas. <clears throat> And then it says in verse, uh, uh, verse 30, <coughs> Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So obviously th this means that the, he did many other signs after his resurrection. He just tells of a few here. A couple of things, a couple of events, appearances to the disciples happened on the first day of the week. Okay, this is right after his resurrection. His resurrection happens, and then on that Sunday, uh, he appears to them. <coughs> okay, so what does that prove so far? Well, nothing. I mean, if it underscores anything, it underscores uh, the meaning of the wave sheaf. You know, the wave sheaf. If it, if, if it proves anything, it underscores that. Or if it, you know, if it, because obviously you see the symbolism there. But it just says it's the first day of the week. Now, another uh, thing, uh, thing about it is, uh, just because you see these resurrection appearances on the day, you know, the daylight period portion after he's, ris he's risen from the dead, I mean, that's the, that's, that'd be the logical time he would first begin to appear. But do we suppose that he only appeared? You have these two instances here where he appeared on a Sunday and then evidently the next Sunday he appeared again. Are we to suppose those were the only appearance? He'd only appeared on Sundays. Well, look at, look at what it says in Acts uh, chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. 
beginning in verse 1, says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So are we to assume that during that 40 days it was only on Sundays? No, no, he appeared, remember, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us he appeared to 500 brethren at once. Remember also that uh, in chapter, go back to chapter 21 in John. And after talking about these resurrection appearances on that first day of the week, and the one that came eight days later, chapter 21 says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. This is an undesignated time here. It says, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. I, I guess it could have been a Sunday morning. That's a good time to go fishing. But anyway, I go fit. They said to him, we will go with you. So they went, you know, of course, Jesus appeared there. They didn't know who it was at first, but there again was an appearance and he had a meal with them. So you had all kinds of appearances during this 40 day period. And just because it mentions the first day of the week a couple of times, what does that prove? Nothing, nothing. Because he obviously must have appeared many other times during that 40 day period. <clears throat> now then the next scripture, so I think that, you know, again, we, we see no, no proof there that there's any kind of change from the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day to the first day of the week. Now, in uh, the next scripture that's given here is Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. It says, uh, Paul says, or, or I think it's Paul talking here. Uh, yes, Paul is, uh, he says, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, perhaps it's Luke telling the story. It was Luke, yes. On the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. Oh, there it is. First day of the week, we gathered together to break bread. That's, what does that mean? To have the Eucharist. <laughs> That's the way it's interpreted. Come together for the Lord's Supper or the, the Eucharist. That's the way it's normally interpreted. <clears throat> but, you know, it does mean, it really, it does mean they came together to eat. Very simply, the first day of the week when we came, were, come to, were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them intending to depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. And it says, there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Hey, Paul at least spoke till midnight. I mean, I've, I've seen eyes close after five minutes. <laughs> but anyway, so it the, 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 turns out Eutychus was okay. But you notice something else here. It says... Uh, uh, then after this, says, uh, do not, he said, do not be alarmed, for the light, his life is in him. Verse 11, and when Paul had gone up and had broken bread, so he had another Eucharist. This is over in the wee hours now. <laughs> and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak. Now, he, in other words, there, were food, there was food there because these people were gathered together. And this was a meeting that apparently, it, it, this first day of the week, it was either on a Friday night. No, no, I'm sorry. It, was, it says early the first day of the week, either on a Saturday night or late in the day on Sunday. Because usually when people get together for dinner, they usually start before the sun is down. So they begin, I would say that's probably the case. It was probably a late Sunday evening meeting, and we'll talk about why they had that. Not, it's not sunset yet, so it was still in Sunday, the first day of the week. They came together, and then soon nightfall took place, and then Paul kept talking and talking. It's midnight, 
and then uh, the event with Eutychus happened, and then uh, he's okay, so they talk some more and some more, and they eat again. And, uh, uh, you, and you're wondering, what's, this, what's going on here? Is this some kind of special religious meeting that went on regularly? Now, there's a reason they were gathered together, and the reason that they spent so much time. But you remember, if you go back here, take a look, just, we'll come back to our text there, but uh, in the previous, in leading up to this, you see that uh, Paul and company, look at, uh, well, look back to uh, verse uh, 6. Said, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, and this is where this takes place, where we stayed for seven days. So they had been there. Now, this was the seventh day they'd been there. They'd been there seven days when this particular meeting, which is on the first day of the week, again, probably late Sunday, uh, just before dark, still the first day of the week, and they came together to break bread. And this, you know, the thing is, they'd probably been doing this those whole seven days. Coming together and eating together and having fellowship and Paul talking to them and them having discussion and so on. And again, I'll tell you why that was in just a few moments. But back to the uh, later, down in verse 13, but, but uh, well, verse 11, it said, When Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a little while until daybreak, and so departed, and they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Now, there's a reason, again, there's a reason that he spent so much time with these people on this particular meeting. This obviously wasn't a regular Sunday meeting because you don't go all night every time. Uh, this is something special. Look at verse uh, 22. He says, and now behold, I am going. This is after he left. He goes to uh, uh, Miletus. Miletus. And he sends for, he sent to Ephesus to have the elders of the Ephesian church come and meet with him. And that's like 30 miles away. So it's very important, very important that he share a message with them as well. It says in verse 22, And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Paul knew that there was, in all probability, he would never come back and see them again, not in this life. He would not see them again. So why did he spend so much time in Troas with the brethren there? Because they knew, he knew, that he's going and they wouldn't see him again, probably. And to the Ephesian elders, he calls them 30 mi from 30 miles away. And uh, they come to meet with him and he spends time with them. To warn them of things that are coming. Because he knows He's not going to see them again. He's not going to be there to minister to them anymore. So that's what's going on here. And further in verse 36 it says, And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again and they accompanied him to the ship. So Paul knew that he was going away. They wouldn't see him again. And this is why he's having these special meetings. This is why he stays around so long in Troas. I brought this up to someone one the time. And they, they wanted to argue. No, no, this is indicated a first day, regular first day meeting. I said, no. They said, well, it couldn't be just a bye-bye meeting. I said, no, it wasn't just a bye-bye meeting. You know, good, but just to say goodbye, it was, it was bye-bye, but it was like bye-bye from now until the resurrection. That's a very, that's why they stuck around all night. <coughs> so, that doesn't give us any, there's not a, a single clue there of any kind of change in the Sabbath, is there? At the fourth commandment, none at all. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the next one is, uh, for the next scripture that's given here is 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And, and this is one, you see, you hear people stumbling across this one all the time. I say stumbling, they come across this one. They assume what this means is uh, Paul is referring to a regular time of meeting. And he's urging people to, you know, they're preparing a gift 
a, a special gift that they're going to give to send to the Jerusalem church because of the famine there and the suffering of some of the brethren there. <clears throat> they're going to, Paul is going to deliver it. And uh, the, it is assumed that this text says, when you come together in your regular Sunday meetings, then make sure you bring your, your offerings there and uh, so they can be stored there in the facility. There's assuming there's some kind of regular facility. And uh, then when I come, it'll be all packed up and ready for me to, to leave with. But that's not exactly what he's saying here. He says, uh, now, concerning the collection for the saints, this is verse 1. <clears throat> As I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. It is, if it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. So <clears throat> that's the instructions. Now what does it mean? I understand how somebody could take it. Oh, well, they must have been meeting on the first day of the week on a regular basis. And uh, he's telling them to bring it to the meeting with you, whatever you have every first day of the week, every Sunday, come to the meeting with your offering. Well, the problem is that uh, there's an expression, put something aside. It's a, a parhuto in uh, the Greek. And it almost certainly means you put it aside at home. Now, what does that mean? Why would they put it aside at home? And what advantage would that be? Well, for this, is this, this very reason. Let's suppose that uh, uh, we were taking up for some kind of disaster and to help some people out. And uh, we're doing something like this. And uh, say, uh, you know, you're urged to uh, save up something. We're going we're gonna to collect it on a certain day. You wouldn't bring it here and uh, say, I'm going to bring this every, you know, every week. No, what you would do, rather than get here on that day and reach in your pocket, oh, 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 yeah, I think I've got to. No, no, you set it aside week by week by week. And then when finally that day arrives, when the people are coming to take the, your, your gift to the needy people, then uh, you've got, you've got a, a, a good collection there. That's what he's talking about. You put it aside in your own home. That way you won't be rushing around and trying to, you know, reaching in your pockets as it were, or trying to come up with something at the last minute. Now you have a good collection of things, money and other things, whatever the supplies were, to be delivered to Jerusalem. It makes all the sense in the world. So almost certainly this, this and many commentaries would agree with that, uh, this means a collection that takes place at home. Also, the other word he uses here, store it up, translated here, store it up, it is uh, the sorizon in the Greek. And that's a term that not a word you would use if you were talking about taking an offering, receiving an offering, taking up an offering. That's not the word you would use. This is the word you would use if you're storing something up or setting it aside in your own home. That's what it's, uh, so it's, it's pretty obvious that he's not talking about a collection taken up at a church service, but something you do in your home. He designates first day of the week. Is there a good reason for that? Well, if payday, it depends on when payday is, I suppose. But what his point here is, uh, you know, if you're paid on Friday, and you know, some people were paid every day back then of the week, work week, but uh, first day of the week would be a good time to sort through what you can do. Uh, that's you know a fresh new work week, and then the you know you come to Friday, then you keep the Sabbath, and then the next first day of the week is, again would be a good time to set aside the, that offering, or that uh, that amount, whatever it is you're going to set aside. <clears throat> so this has really has again this says nothing about any kind of transfer of the seventh day or the seventh day requirements to the first day of the week. And then Mark chapter 16 and verse 9. Mark chapter 16. Uh, 
Okay, this is, uh, let me see, I'll just go ahead and read it. It says, now when, when he rose early, on the first day of the week, this could be understood two different ways. When he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared to first to Mary Magdalene, or when he, now when he rose early, and then comma, on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary, Mary Magdalene, to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Uh, I don't know for sure what the, this is just a reference to the first day of the week. What does that, that's, that's just a reiteration of what's said elsewhere. So uh, no need to do that again. This was at the day that he rose from the dead. But the final scripture then is in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. The final proof text is given here. Chapter 1, verse 10. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. Now, what he writes... If you read through, you just read through the book of Revelation, you see what he writes. What is one of the major themes, or the major theme of Revelation? You know, you have the seals and you have the trumpets and all of that. You know, the, the four seals, the first four seals, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the fifth seal, uh, persecution, martyrdom of saints in a time of tribulation, sixth seal, the heavenly signs announcing, announcing, the seventh seal and the rest of the book after chapter what is it five or so the rest of the book yeah the chapter from uh, after chapter six is about the seventh seal and what is the seventh seal represent the day of the lord so it is possible very possible i thought i'll offer you two interpretations of this lord's day uh, it's very possible that he just uses the expression Lord's Day as a reference to the final day of the Lord. He was in vision, in spirit, in vision, in the day of the Lord. In other words, he was seeing, it was through this visionary experience that he was seeing things pertaining to the day of the Lord. Okay? That's one, uh, one way of understanding it. And it's uh, many, many uh, commentaries would hold to that. Uh, the other way, another way of understanding it is he's simply there. He's, he's talking about the Sabbath. Jesus says, would he say he was Lord of what? Sabbath. The Sabbath day. So when is the Lord's day? The Sabbath day. So this could be a reference simply to the Sabbath day. He was in spirit, meaning in vision, having prophetic visions on the Sabbath day. It's a possibility. So taken either way. So why would one read this as Sunday? Well, it's because what they do, it's, it's anachronistic really, what they do, they take later church fathers who use the same expression, Lord's Day, and applied it to Sunday. And what they like to do especially is go to Ignatius in his epistle to the Magnesians and point out that, oh, look at this, look at this. It says no longer sabbatizing as the Jews do, but observing the Lord's Day. There it is. There it is, no Sabbath keeping but the Lord's Day. And it becomes very clear he's talking about Sunday. But actually it's not that clear because when you look at the epistles that are attributed to Ignatius, you will soon discover, if you do any research at all, you will soon discover that the longer versions, that there's a whole slew of them that are, all scholars agree, are spurious it means they took some, some fragments or some portions of the writings of Ignatius from the early, early second century. I mean, the guy apparently lived during the first century, but uh, here he was writing in the early second century. But people later, perhaps out in the fourth century, added a bunch of stuff to it. So all scholars recognize that, the, that a great number of those epistles of Ignatius are actually spurious. And the ones that are deemed to be legitimate themselves, it is understood that they too have been doctored a little bit. There have been some editing going on. You know, we only have certain fragments and you can only test it so far, but you read some of those, those that are considered legitimate, and it sure sounds like 4th century language to me. When you understand the issues of the 4th century, you think, you mean Ignatius believed that all the way back then? So it, it, some people refer also to a document called the Didache, 
It was a very early document, but it was revised over time. But uh, they refer to that, but it doesn't, it doesn't d designate the Lord's Day either. Now, that expression, that, that term in Ignatius about sabbatizing instead of sabbatizing as the Jews do but observing the Lord's day actually almost certainly means rather than sabbatizing as the Jews meaning this rigorous way that they approach the Sabbath but observing the Lord's life in other words following the example of Jesus Christ it has nothing to do with the Lord's day but his life and you imitating that example now Jesus said that he's Lord of the Sabbath he, when he, what he did with the Sabbath, if you read through all the Sabbath scriptures, just go through concordance and look up Sabbath and see all that uh, Jesus did on the Sabbath. You see again and again, he relieved people from bondage. He healed people. He brought out the full meaning and true meaning of the Sabbath and uh, stripped away some of those Pharisaic traditions that had been attached to it, which amounted to making the Sabbath, which was meant to be a delight, into a burden. So that's what he did. So uh, no doubt Ignatius was referring to that and may have actually may have actually been supporting Sabbath keeping because if you look back through history you see that uh, Sabbath keeping even those who observed a Sunday Lord's Day also observed the Sabbath in some measure in some way. The, the, they had the sacred mysteries as they call them. You know the meaning of the Eucharist and uh, the Lord's Supper as we would say. Uh, on Saturday and Sunday. They acknowledge the Sabbath and to this very day, to this very day, the Eastern Orthodox churches acknowledge the Sabbath. That's why they don't have fasting. They have, you know, they have fast days, about a third of the days a year are fasting for them, a, a form of fasting, meaning uh, restriction of some sort. But they don't fast on the Sabbath because it is a memorial of creation and they call it the Sabbath. You know, several years ago when we had uh, an academy going there in Tyler, uh, we, were just, we were talking about, in one of my classes, we were talking about com comparative religion, comparative theology especially, and we're covering uh, Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Now, we're familiar with the Western, with Western theology, because the Protestant churches came out of the Western, the Roman Catholic. And so all of us in the West are more familiar. We came from Methodist and back, uh, Ma uh, Baptist and Presbyterian and Lutheran backgrounds, and that came out of Catholicism. And, uh, but we're not as familiar with the Eastern religion, that is the Eastern Orthodox. Uh, we're more familiar with this Western approach to things rather than the Eastern. But we went over to uh, Dallas. They wanted, the class wanted to do this, is their idea. They wanted to go to uh, an Eastern Orthodox liturgy just to see it for themselves and I noticed that in the announcements which is after services but uh, after the liturgy and it was a long drawn out thing I thought it would never end but anyway and then they had the little homily tacked right onto the end homily meaning sermon it was a, more of a sermonette but anyway uh, after all of that then they had the announcements and they were referring to an event they had something that's going on the next Saturday they didn't call it Saturday. They called it next Sabbath. They called it Sabbath. They still call it Sabbath. And you know, some of those ancient churches or churches that are still exist today, they have roots in ancient times, they still observe in some manner, like the church in Ethiopia, uh, the Sabbath. The Sabbath and the so-called Lord's Day. They do them both together. And you find references to that throughout the history. That's a, that's, a, that's a study in itself. A lot of information there. But uh, just, to, uh, just to show you that, uh, just to mention that in passing, that it wasn't altogether eradicated, especially in the East. It was basically Rome, Rome, and uh, it, well, that was the big, the, the primary mover of getting rid of the Sabbath. They started telling people that the Bishop of Rome started telling, started giving orders you need to work on Saturday in order to distance themselves from the Jews. That's what uh, took place there. But in other parts of the world, it wasn't happening. And they still observed the Sabbath, at least to some measure, but maybe not properly, but they still acknowledged it as the Sabbath and had it in their, uh, within their practice, their custom. So, anyway, the point here is that you, the, the expression, the, the use of the word, the expression Lord's Day in reference to Sunday uh, does not appear 
until about the middle of the second century. That's a long time to go by. So what you have to do is you have to look at its appearances uh, in the late or in the middle of the second century and read it back into this text. And I, the question I have that comes out of that just how how reasonable is that? How likely is that that John had the Lord's Day, the Sunday Lord's Day in mind when you don't even see it until, you know, a long time later? I think it's unlikely, very unlikely. So this proves not, none of these texts prove anything about, this, about uh, the transfer of Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. Now, <clears throat> We're basically out of time, but I'm gonna, I'll, I want to, to mention some other aspect of this. I wanted to read from another book here. Uh, this one is uh, entitled, From Sabbath to Lord's Day. This is the most scholarly anti-Sabbatarian work you will find. It's a symposium. All these different evangelical scholars, very conservative. They are reformed, but they do not, they do not adhere to everything in this. They're non-Sabbatarian, meaning that they not only do they not observe the seventh day Sabbath, but they don't believe the seventh day Sabbath was ever transferred. So Sunday they observe a Lord's Day, but they say that is not a Sabbath. That's not the Sabbath. Okay, so there's a, theirs is a third position. And it's very interesting in some of the things they said say and uh, I'll try to wrap this up pretty quickly, but uh, let me just get over here to uh, a couple of paragraphs I wanted to read from a couple of different pages. But first of all, the question regarding the creation narrative, <coughs> and I want to spend more time on that, but I won't get it, be able to. But anyway, I just wanted to read this one statement. Uh, this, is, this is by... Uh, Professor A.T. Lincoln, very well known. I think he died maybe a year or two ago, but A.T. Lincoln, uh, well-known uh, Reformed theologian. He says, if the hypothesis of the Sabbath as a creation ordinance could be established, then whatever the temporary nature of the Sabbath as part of the Mosaic Covenant, the appeal could still be made to the permanence of the mandate for one day of rest as inherent to humanity made in the image of God. And then he says, as chapter 11 indicates, both Luther and Calvin held to the notion of the Sabbath as a creation ordinance, but failed to relate it consistently to the rest of their position. So there you, there you have it. But what he's saying here is, look, uh, if you can show that the Sabbath was a creation ordinance, you see, a lot of people today say it wasn't. It wasn't. They say the Sabbath was instituted in, uh, what is it, Exodus 16? Or, yeah, Exodus 16, when the, the God sent the manna. He said, uh, you know, you gather each day, gather the day's supply, but gather twice as much on the sixth day. The, next, the, the seventh day will be the Sabbath. Uh, many people, you'll find it in many textbooks, they believe that's when the Sabbath was instituted. And that this was, the reason they showed, chose six days and seven, you know, six days and then the seventh day of Sabbath, was to follow the pattern set forth when he rested on that one day in creation, in the creation week. So it was not a consistent seven-day weekly cycle in the each week ending with the Sabbath, uh, up through that time, but this was instituted at that time only based on the creation pattern. Which if you read the commandment itself, it says before, this is, it gives you the reason. It, it, it clearly links the two together. But any, in any case, he says if, if that can be established, if it can be established that the Sabbath is a creation ordinance, uh, then you, can, you have a case for having a continuance of the Sabbath. You know, he doesn't really get into whether seventh day or first day at this point. But later, later, interestingly, he says, uh, he says, uh, let me read this. This is uh, from page 392. He says, those Sabbatarians who held, talk, and they, when he says Sabbatarians, he's talking about those who, the transfer theorists, 
They believe Sabbath was transferred to Sunday. They're still called Sabbatarians. Those Sabbatarians who held that it was, and, partic and particularly those like uh, Boundy, who held that the whole Decalogue, the whole Decalogue was binding as moral law and continued or contained, quote, nothing ceremonial, nothing typical, nothing to be abrogated, unquote, were extremely hard-pressed to explain why they were not observing the Seventh-day Sabbath. <laughs> to become a Seventh-day Sabbatarian is the only consistent course of action for anyone who holds that the whole Decalogue is binding as moral law. Without turning there, I'll just refer you to James, the book of James, when he says, if you break the law... And he mentions a couple of the commandments, and it makes it clear he's talking about the Decalogue. If you break it in one point, you break the whole law. It's like this. If you have, a, say, a, some kind of weight, some kind of something suspended by a chain, and uh, you break one link in the chain, you break the chain, and whatever you're having, whatever's suspended from that chain is going to come down. So you break the whole law. So what does that tell us? That the Decalogue is a unified whole... Yes, it has points, it has points, but you cannot separate them and say, well, I choose this one, this one, and this one, but I don't like that one very much. No, no, it's a unified whole. To break one point is to break it all. So what does that say about the fourth commandment? It belongs to the unified whole, and to break it is to break the law. As simple as that. So, yeah, I think it's very clear that... Uh, uh, it's crystal clear, in fact, that the, de the whole Decalogue remains in force. Now, uh, there's several other points here I would like to read, but, but for time's sake, I'm going to skip over that uh, and go to uh, go to a, like to go to a scripture now in Mark uh, chapter two. Mark chapter two. Verse 23, on Sabbath, or, or I'm sorry, one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain, and the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, where in the law does it say that you can't do that? I suppose their argument is, well, if you can't go out and gather manna, you can't, certainly can't be plucking uh, heads of grain. <clears throat> but that's not a very good argument. <laughs> but uh, in any case, and, and he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, Abiathar the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. You see, the, of course, the... Uh, uh, the point here is human need rises above those uh, the such things as that. The human need is more important. But uh, the other thing is uh, this is what David did. And David was on a mission, a special mission. And he's comparing David with himself, the son of David, the Messiah. And he is on an even greater mission. That's the point. So he lets his disciples eat grain on the Sabbath day. That is not, you know, that's, that's not a violation of anything. But in any case, he, he's, this is partly to point to his own messiahship. But he, he, he brings out some important things about the Sabbath here. He says, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now some people would interpret this as, say, well, yeah, the Sabbath is made for pe people. Of course it was. Those people happened to be Israelites. You read about it when it was made for them in Exodus 16. But, you know, but that's, that's, that's misreading this statement. Notice what it says. Two things here that are made. Have you ever noticed that? Two things are mentioned that are made. It says the Sabbath was made for man. Man, not man. In other words, man was not made for the Sabbath. Where do you find a scripture that talks about two things being made? Genesis 1 and 2. This man was made on the sixth day, 
and the Sabbath was made the very next day on the seventh day. So is it a creation ordinance? According to this, it was. Yes, it was, a, it was an ordinance of creation. You know, there are two great creation ordinances. Actually, maybe more, but two that are brought out in Scripture. And they become very clear. It becomes very clear if you look at it. And you go back and read Genesis 2. I was going to do that, but we don't have time to get into everything I wanted to cover. But uh, in Genesis 2, you see that God established the Sabbath right there. That's a creational ordinance. That's one of them. And the other is when he, he gave Eve to Adam. He took a part of, you know, tissue or whatever from Adam's side, made the woman. And now, and what did Adam say upon receiving this? She's bone of my, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. And it uh, goes on to say that what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. So this is, this is the, that's this marriage is the second creation ordinance that are brought out here. And isn't it interesting that the fourth and fifth commandments, the fourth commandment pertains to the Sabbath, and the fifth commandments, honor your father, that says father, honor your father and your mother, presupposes marriage. So you have right in there in the heart of the Ten Commandments, you have those two creation ordinances. And I don't think it's uh, accidental. I don't think it's accidental. Uh, just in closing, well, let's look at a couple of other scriptures. With that in mind, look at Hebrews 4. Don't want to leave this one out. <clears throat> Here the writer is talking about, uh, he says, he's talking about the rest, a rest that Joshua was unable to give to the, or that, uh, you know, that there's a rest that the scripture speaks about that was not fulfilled in the time of, jo of Joshua. When Joshua led the people into the promised land, uh, but you know the original Exodus generation fell in the wilderness for the most part. He led them there, but that wasn't the final rest for the people of God. And it says then, when, with this in mind, it says, for he has to, verse 4, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his work. And again, this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. So he connects the Sabbath with God's rest. And it, to make a long, rather going, going through this and, and expounding on it thoroughly, uh, the rest, the rest he's talking about is, number one, the redemptive rest we enter into when we are converted upon receiving Jesus Christ, upon repentance, baptism, and so on. We enter into redemptive rest, but this points to the eschatological rest, the ultimate rest we will enter into when this mortal puts on immortality and this corruptible puts on incorruptibility and uh, when we're at long last in that ultimate rest. And what this tells us then is that the Sabbath, the seventh day, points to that. So can you say it's all been fulfilled? It's all, no, no, there's still something to be done. We still keep the Sabbath in pointing to that ultimate final rest, which is fellowship with God eternally. And then he goes on to say, <clears throat> I'll just read on down to it. It says, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David, so long afterward, this is a long time after <clears throat> those events, where Joshua led them into the promised land. In the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So in other words, you can still, you can, there's still an opportunity. It says, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. In other words, that wasn't all of it when Joshua led them into the promised land. There's still more. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, or the Sabbatismos is the term, a keeping of the Sabbath for the people of God. For what, <clears throat> whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his, did from his. So what this is telling us, that there is an eschatological Sabbath to which the weekly Sabbath points. It's a symbol of the future Sabbath, the future rest that we look for and await. So what does that say about observing the Sabbath now? Oh, it's all done away, even though it hasn't been finally fulfilled. No, that doesn't make sense, does it? No, 
It's more than just a shadow. It's more, it is a memorial of creation, but more than that, it points not only to creation. If you read Deuteronomy 5, you see it symbolizes uh, also redemption. And uh, in this text here, you see it symbolizes the future. So it remains a sign, a sign for the people of God. And now the other thing there I mentioned, I'm not going to turn to it, Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul mentions very specifically the fifth commandment, the first commandment with, with promise. And if you look at that promise, if you, want to, if you want to think, as many of these many people do, that what they do, they separate what they think is the ritual part of the commandment from the uh, spiritual part of the commandment. They think the ritual part of the fourth commandment is the specific day. That, that's the ritual part. But the spiritual part is uh, just, you know, one day in seven, so let's make it the Lord's Day. Let's make it Sunday. Uh, but, the, you know, that, you see the problems with that. But, and also, the, the other thing, though, I was going to mention here, that other creation ordinance, Paul says in uh, Ephesians 5, I'll just refer you to it. He tells the children, he urges them to be obedient to their parents. And then he, he says, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise. You go back and look at the promise. And it says that your the days may be long in the land. What's he talking about? <clears throat> the land that God gave to Israel. So wait a minute, wait a minute. That, that's Israel. But Paul applies that to Gentiles in Ephesus, doesn't he? Showing the universal nature of that law. So you get what I'm saying here? That even though it specifically mentions the land and has the land of promise in mind in the original commandment Paul understands that it expands beyond that and is in fact universal in scope the same with the Sabbath even though it uh, in Deuteronomy 5 it calls attention to the fact that they went came out of Egypt reminds of them of their own redemption nevertheless Exodus 20 points to the creation but more than that you see in Hebrews 4 that it also points to the future so it still remains a sign for the people of God. That's not something restricted to the Old Testament, not something restricted to Israel, but something from Old Testament through the New you find support for, that it still remains a, uh, <clears throat> a symbol or a sign. A symbol is a sign. A sign is a symbol uh, for this future rest that we enter into, as well as that rest that we now participate in. So, there's so much more to this topic. Maybe we can continue at some point. There's some more reading I wanted to do here. But uh, I can see that we're out of time. So, we'll save it for another day.